Hello friends, it is Jessica from Three Rivers Homestead and I'm back with another weekly video for you. In this week's video, we're going to talk about sprouting wheat berries. I'm going to give you a cellar update. We're going to talk about apple cider and apple scrap vinegar. We're going to get out in the garden. Lots of really fun things uh, to share with you that happened this week. So if that's something that interests you, why don't you stick around and join us as we recap the projects that happened this week at Three Rivers Homestead. Our week was very stormy. We had a lot of severe weather. Last Saturday, Adam woke us all up in the middle of the night and we were out in our tornado shelter until about two o'clock in the morning. And thankfully we didn't have any damage other than some limbs down after that storm. And then again on Wednesday, we had tornado uh, warnings in effect, or watches in effect, I'm sorry. Um, warnings were in surrounding areas, but we never actually had the sirens go off or had to get into the shelter on that day. And we are extremely grateful for that. But it was just some really awful weather in our area. So I'm praying that any of you that were in the path of that storm uh, are all safe because it was pretty yucky. But one of the benefits of a storm like that is that all of the friends and family in our area and coworkers and things that have trees that come down and that don't burn with wood throughout the winter, they will call us up after a storm and ask us if we'd like to come get the tree out of their yard. So we're doing them a favor by hauling the wood away that they don't want. And then this provides us with free heat. So this wood will sit out and it will dry out over this year. And Adam will have to split it up and get it stacked. And then this will provide us with free heat next winter because you guys know that we heat exclusively with wood. We do not have a furnace or anything like that. So this is always a blessing. So God can use these storms to bless us. And we are just really grateful for that. Another blessing that came out of the storm was just a healthy dose of perspective. You know, I've been very down lately. You guys knew a couple videos ago, I was kind of complaining about the state of our homestead in the yard and just the mess that is happening with this cellar project. And having those storms come through and actually knowing people personally who had severe property damage and loss of homes just was a healthy dose of perspective that made me appreciate the mess that we do have because at least our home is standing right now. We could have lost everything in a tornado or something like that. And so we are just choosing to make the best of this messy situation. The kids are playing king of the hill there. We're going to have a summer full of mud and dirt, and we are just going to enjoy that this year. So why don't I give you a quick update on how that cellar project is going. They have begun tearing up the concrete. Basically everything around the house is going to be dug up. You guys know that we are exposing the foundation of the house. They're waterproofing it. They are drawing water away so that our cellar can be dried out and used as a place to store food, like a cold cellar or a root cellar. So everything has been torn up. This is the mess that I'm talking about. Let me kind of show you the progress that has been made so far because they have gotten quite a bit done. You guys know our house was built in 1867, so this is a really old house that needed a lot of work. What they done, did is dug down six feet all around this area and they put in some drainage and all of it is tiled to this sump pump here and it pumps the water out and they tiled all the way out here behind Adam's garage here. And then that tile goes all the way behind the garage. It ties into the drainage from the garage. And then it all goes out into what we affectionately call the junk woods here. And you can see all of that water sitting out there is from the storms this week. And all of that would be sitting around our house, getting our cellar wet if it weren't being tiled back here. So that's a good visual picture of the importance of this project. I'm going to need to plant a willow or something there to, to suck up some of that moisture you can see our chicken coops and our gardens are over on that side of our junk woods. The bees are over here and that woods fills up with beautiful wildflowers and things to feed the bees. We run our meat birds back there in that area. This little fenced area is our alleyway that helps us load um, cattle up into our trailers or lead them out into the pastures. And then out there are our pastures and you can see our little dog house for the dogs when they're out in the pastures. So anyways, back to 
the cellar mess. In doing this project, they uncovered where our gray water was leading. So we have this sitting here. Our gray water isn't up to code currently. It needs to be rerouted to the septic system, which is an entirely different can of worms. But we were happy to discover where our gray water was actually going because we had no idea. This is what the front of the house currently looks like. And yep, pretty messy and muddy, as you can imagine, especially with the rain. Um, this is where our old septic tank sat. And we, when they were digging around the house, they discovered that it was leaking. Obviously, this septic tank was not up to code. It's too close to the house per modern standards. And it was close to collapsing. We are so grateful that it didn't collapse with children or animals or something walk, walking over it. So it's actually a blessing. We discovered all of this or did the cellar project. What they had to do was temporarily put in kind of like an emergency tank. They moved it away from the house so it was up to code. But this is just temporary. We had to call the county health official out and he took measurements and he sent them to the Ohio EPA and they're determining what kind of septic system we are going to have to put in to make it all up to code and to fix this issue. We thought we were going to have maybe another five years before we had to deal with this mess of the septic, um, but it looks like since it was leaking, it had to be done now. But something fun that they discovered when they did this is this is an old coal chute, kind of a relic of this old house, which is really cool. And we thought about digging it up and, you know, filling it in, but we decided to keep it. I think it's going to be a neat way to save the old relic. And also this is going to become the cold air intake for my cold room that I'm building down there in the root cellar. So we will somehow put a pipe here and lead that down, and that is what will feed the cold air into that cellar. So it's a huge mess, you guys. You know, I know we had talked before about building a dining room addition off of the back of the house, and Adam and I this week, after discovering the septic, sort of came to the conclusion that that is not going to happen. That is not going to be a reality with what we are going to have to um, pay to fix the septic issue. But instead, what we're looking to do back here is we're going to build a stone kind of patio. It's going to go back here. And it will tie in over here to our outdoor tub and shower. That's what is behind that fenced area back there. It's a place where we can shower kids off outside. That patio will go all in between here where they're ripping up the concrete. And it will have an outdoor kitchen and a picnic table area. And it'll be really lovely. And it'll just have to do for now. And then maybe sometime in the future we could readdress the idea of a dining room being built on the back here. But that is the update with... The cellar, as I mentioned, this week really helped me provide some perspective on the whole situation, and I'm just really grateful we have our home, our old home, <laughs> and Lord willing, when it's all over with, we will have a functioning root cellar that will just make everything easier and free up some space in the house. All right, on to kitchen projects. I was reminded that I had apple cider that had been brewing all winter. We've been going through a lot of apple cider, taking care of the chicks, and I will share more about that later. But that reminder um, was what I needed to get this all bottled up. So to store my apple cider that's been brewing, all I need to do is put it in a clean jar and it'll get a lid on it and that will go up on our pantry shelves. If you want to learn more about making apple cider or apple scrap vinegar, I will link a video in the description. It'll show you all of the steps for how to do that. I also have a highlight on Instagram that explains it. But this is a mother of vinegar. This is the colony of bacteria that helps brew and ferment the vinegar. Just showing you a couple of them from the jars, how they can kind of look different, but both of these are healthy. They're just kind of like a slimy pancake, like a kombucha scoby. And we save these, and those will jumpstart future batches of vinegar. I put them in a jar, fill it up with vinegar, and then when we want to start a new batch, I can throw one of those mothers of vinegar into the jar, and it will make it happen a lot faster. So we ended up with one and a half gallons of vinegar here, plus our little jar of mothers, and I'm very happy with that. That was about $7.50 of organic apple cider last uh, fall that I was able to put away and turn into vinegar. We're just pouring some of that into some grain to, to start soaking, and I'm gonna explain more about that later in this video. 
But getting the vinegar down reminded me that I still had a little bit of apple left in storage. We just have a half a bushel that was left out in our overflow fridge. These were picked in the first week of November last year. These were our storage varieties. And you can see some of them look a little yucky, but most of them, the cameo apples look amazing and they're still firm. So I am not gonna worry about turning these into applesauce. We have enough applesauce on the shelves. The kids are gonna be able to eat the rest of these raw. We moved them into the kitchen fridge and then we will just bake with the ones that are starting to soften up. And we'll make some apple pies and apple cobblers and fritters and all of that this week. Grace is in and she was asking for some apple cider to go water the chicks. Like I mentioned, this is what we do. We add about a half a cup of apple cider vinegar to every half gallon of water that we give our young chicks. And there is a reason for this. That apple cider vinegar is full of probiotic. It's super healthy, just like humans drink it for the health benefit. It benefits the chicks in the same way. There are also other um, conditions that the chicks are susceptible to that this apple cider vinegar will help prevent. So Gracie is responsible for taking care of our chicks. And so she gives them this water every day and it can prevent something called pasty butt. So when chicks are born, they when they're under stress or temperature fluctuations, their feces can kind of create a plug at their vent. And if it's left um, and not treated, it will eventually kill the chick. And so the apple cider vinegar helps their feces um, to not become clogged. And then Gracie then checks the chicks every day just to make sure that they're not getting pasty and pasting up. And, um, and then that's how we prevent that from happening. So these chicks right here were hatched two weeks ago in a video we showed you these guys. These are our home grown, home hatched chicks. And since we already had chicks in the brooder, I was at Tractor Supply and the chicks were calling out to me and I couldn't resist. So we got some more. Um, these are ISA brown chicks. Some of my favorite egg layers, they lay consistently an egg every day, so I was happy to bring some of them home and add them to the brooder. Miss Grace here not only takes care of the chicks, she takes care of all of the poultry here on our homestead. She does our egg laying hens, our ducks, and if we have meat birds, she will also take care of them. And she is extremely grateful for the water that the storms this week provided in rain. It allows her to use our rain barrels to do her watering. Normally, if the rain barrels aren't full or if they're frozen over, she has to hand pump water to water all of the poultry. And so this is just really convenient for her to be able to open up the rain barrel and let it pour out and fill her buckets. As I mentioned, Grace is in charge of the poultry. My two older boys are in charge of taking care of our dogs and any cattle that we have on the property at the time. We have three dogs, they are livestock guardians. We have a mom and a dad and one of their babies and they are Boz Shepherds. We absolutely adore them. This is Harry, this is the baby of the bunch. And so the big boys feed and water them twice a day and then they also go out and care for the cattle, take care of cleaning up their shelters, things like that. So very grateful for my big kids and the ways they contribute to the family and help us grow all of this uh, protein. Time to start focusing on the garden. The weather is turning. We are very excited about that. This week, we had to up pot our pepper plants. We started pepper seeds in the beginning of February, and they have grown now to the point that they need to be separated. Any of them that were kind of double seeded in their little cells need to be separated and put into larger pots. Little Levi was doing that with me, and he was getting a homeschool science lesson all about the roots of plants and how the roots help feed the plant. So we were killing two birds with one stone on this day and doing some much needed gardening work while also tackling a homestead science topic. And so all I do is I gently pull apart the two seedlings that might be growing in the same cell, loosen up the dirt from the roots and try not to tear those roots. And then they get replanted in a larger pot that will give them space to kind of grow and hopefully this pot will be big enough for them until they're ready to be transplanted into the garden. Since I had empty seed trays, we decided to go ahead and sow some oregano. 
We are going to try this toothache plant. I bought the seeds last year and never got around to planting it. So we are going to try this this year just for fun. Also doing some basil. I winter sowed some basil, but I want to do extra just in case because I did lose a few jugs to mice and I have to have basil in my garden. And then we're also just for fun going to plant some hollyhocks. Not everything is about production and food. We also want to have beauty in our garden and that also feeds the bees. The more flowers, the better. You can never have enough flowers in your garden or on your property. I don't start much inside because I am very limited in grow light space, but we have our tomatoes here that need to be separated out and up potted probably in the next week. We have our peppers and then we just do a few herbs and flowers. Everything else is winter sown or directly sown in the garden. And as I mentioned, the soil has warmed up and we were able to get out in the garden this week, which was just lovely. The soil in these raised beds is so beautiful and it is just full of earthworms and that is a lovely sight. I was very happy to get my hands in the dirt this week and we were planting onions. So what I'm doing right here, I use a muffin tray to kind of press into the soil and make some little indents. It's the perfect spacing and then I can just put one onion plant per muffin hole if that makes sense. I'm planting Patterson onions on this particular day. A local friend grew these and I bought them from him. I've had terrible results in the past growing my own onions from seed. I also don't do well when I buy sets from maybe the garden center. They don't grow as well as plant starts do. So I was happy to have a local source of these. Patterson onions are a great storage variety so I'm filling one entire bed with these Patterson onions and I'm hoping to do one more bed with maybe a red onion variety or a, a different type of onion. We'll probably mix and match. So they're looking a little sad right now. They always do when you first plant them. But after a couple good rains and, and a little time here in the bed, they'll perk right back up. And Lord willing, we will have a beautiful onion harvest. It feels so good to get that first dirt manicure of the year. I love it. So this is what the garlic that we planted last fall looks like. It's doing lovely. We have four beds of garlic going, and that should be enough for our garlic needs for the year. Here are our winter sown jugs. If you look in there, that is some rainbow chard that has sprouted up. Let's see what's in the other jugs. That is looking like some kind of brassica. Here we have lettuce. And all of these are doing lovely. We have some more lettuce in this jug. That looks like a Marvel of Four Seasons. I believe this is parsley right here. And then unfortunately, mice chewed into several. This is the first time that happened to me and ate a lot of the seed in other jugs. So we'll just have to see what sprouts. I was also able to plant strawberries this week. I'm trying a new bed of ever-bearing strawberries. And I'm also transplanting some that I had in these dollar store towers last year. So I typically do June bearing strawberries, meaning that you get one big harvest in the month of June, but I've decided that I wanna spread out the berries so we have a longer season and plant some beds of ever bearing strawberries. That means we'll get smaller harvests, but it'll be spread out through the entire growing season. And so just going to do a little trial because I've heard people in my zone and in my area that haven't had great results with ever bearing strawberries. And so we're just going to do one bed of them this year and, and then next year to see how they do because they might not be uh, fruitful until next year. And if I like them, then we will convert more beds to the ever bearing strawberries. But I'm slowly working on, you guys know that we had an in-ground garden up to a couple years ago. And then last year I converted my half of my garden to raised beds. And so I've been transplanting berries that I had in the ground into various containers, hoping to finally get them in a resting place so that they will be happy again. What I am happy about though, is that I successfully overwintered bees. Well, I say that, but I didn't do anything. The bees did it. They successfully overwintered for the first time. This will be my fourth year of beekeeping. This was a swarm that we trapped last year and they survived. This is the first time. So I am very excited to have more beekeeping content for you this year. I am learning as I go and I will bring you along on that journey and Lord willing, we'll have a good honey harvest.
Okay, next project. As I mentioned, I'm working on sprouting and soaking wheat berries. It's just an experiment I'm doing to see if I like it. To start, what I do, oop, we do not want that mother of vinegar going in there. We'll save that. But what I start by doing is adding just a little bit of vinegar. This is not necessary to do since we're going to sprout these, but it's just out of habit when I'm soaking. I always add a little vinegar to my grains when I soak them. And then we fill the jar the rest of the way with water. This helps break down the phytic acid and makes them more digestible. What we're going to do is let these sit for about 12 hours and they are gonna soak. It's gonna break down that seed coating. And then after 12 hours, we drained out the water, rinsed the wheat berries, and then put them in a bowl in the windowsill to work on sprouting them. By sprouting these, the, you're essentially taking what's a seed and now turning it into a plant. It changes the nutrient profile of the wheat berry you can see the little white tails growing on the berries now. That is germination. These seeds are now sprouting into a plant and it increases the vitamin content and it just has lots of nutrient benefits. So we cleaned out our bowl really well. We're gonna rinse those again and we're gonna put them back into the windowsill to let them continue to grow and let the sprouts get a little longer. Oh, hi excavators. <laughs> They're out there working in the yard. <laughs> Okay, so then the following day, after another 12 hours, we have even longer sprouts. So this is after, I think, about 48 hours total of soaking and, and rinsing. Look at the little tails that we have on our wheat berries. They look amazing. But what we need to do now is dehydrate these so that we can eventually grind them down into flour. There are a couple ways that you can dry these out. If your oven goes below 150 degrees, you can do it. We're gonna use our dehydrator. You just want it below 150 degrees so that you don't kill that nutrition that you worked so hard to get into the wheat berries. You could also use a freeze dryer. You could use a sun oven, anything like that, um, just to try to get these dried out. So this was after about 15 hours in the Excalibur dehydrator. I will link my dehydrator in the description and they are dried and lovely. But I was a little worried. They felt dry from the outside, and because I'm gonna be milling these in my grain mill, I want to make sure that they are completely dry. So I broke a few of them apart just to feel, make sure I don't feel any moisture in there, um, because if you put wet grain into your grain mill, you will gunk up the motor and you will ruin your grain mill. So you really do wanna make sure that you get them completely dried. So now we are going to run those dried wheat berries, those dried sprouted wheat berries through the grain mill and turn it into a flour that we can then bake with. And you may be wondering why go to all of this trouble? What is the point of all of this? Well, as I mentioned, you're increasing the nutrition in your wheat berries. Um, you are increasing the digestibility because you broke down all that phytic acid and you've essentially turned this into a plant instead of it being a seed that is hard to digest. Um, it's just a different product. It's a healthier product. You can purchase sprouted wheat berries through places like Azure Standard, but they are extremely expensive. And so doing it yourself is a way that you can save some money. And for me, this was just a fun experiment. I'm trying it out to see if I like doing this and if we like the taste of it. And if so, then I'm trying to figure out a system that will be easy and sustainable for me to do this to keep up with our baking. Final product, it smells very earthy and nutty. It's pleasant, but it definitely smells different than regular flour. We're gonna store it in the fridge until we plan to use it. You really do wanna use it as soon as possible to get all of the nutritional benefit. A couple hours later, I pulled it out of the fridge and we're gonna make my fruit cobbler. I will leave this recipe in the description and we're just trying it out. As I've mentioned before, using fresh milled grains is entirely different than store-bought flour. It's also going to be different if you're using sprouted wheat, so it just takes a little bit of getting used to. We're going to make an apple cobbler, saving all of my scraps to make more vinegar, and we're just going to see if the family likes the taste of this. So we baked it up, and this was going to be dessert with dinner on this particular day. With it, we were having some Brussels sprouts and mushrooms in bacon grease. I cooked some rice in some chicken drippings, amazing flavor. 
And then this was a, a whole ham. It was a fresh ham that isn't cured. And we did a honey mustard coating on it with some herbs. And then I also did a maple syrup glaze. And that is what we had for dinner on that day. So the verdict on the apple cobbler using the sprouted flour was that it tastes different to them than regular flour, but it also tasted good. They liked it. It was just different. And so I'm still working on a system to figure out how to make all of this happen. You'd have to get into a routine of soaking and drying and milling to meet all of our baking needs. But I think I figured out a way to do it that would only add about 10 extra minutes of work in my day if I get the system streamlined. So as soon as I get it streamlined and I figure out amounts and all of that, I will share it with you. But that was just a fun experiment that we did this week that turned out to be a success and we're pretty excited about it. So I hope that all of you had a wonderful week. I hope you're having a great weekend, a great day today, celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I hope your family is blessed. We will be back next week with another video. And until then, friends, we will see you later. Bye. <laughs>